you who are gathered here this day, both here in person and online, we welcome you. You are welcome here no matter how God made you, no matter what you have been through. We celebrate your presence with us today. Just uh, to let you know the uh, conversation we had, the faith conversation with abortion, we didn't get done last week, so we are continuing that uh, Wednesday at 6, so you are invited to come to that. We also have it on Zoom again, so if you would like to attend that way, it, it, and it's being recorded, so we will we will get you connected if that is a way that you would, you would like to connect. Uh, I know, Keith, John, is there any other announcements? Um, Pentecost picnic. Pentecost picnic. So this is our birthday lunches that we have suspended since of COVID. We are bringing them back and we are doing it on Pentecost, which is the birthday of the church and the birthday of this specific church as well. So it's an appropriate day for us to be back to that since it marks also the one year anniversary since we've been back worshiping in person. So we will be back to celebrating food and fellowship together as well. So bring a, a, a dish to share next week um, and wear red because it's Pentecost and that's the color of the season. So I would love it if, if, if you've got red in your wardrobe, if you pull out some red this coming week. Any other announcements I'm forgetting? Yes, sir. Survey? Trustees yes. meet Tuesday at 7. Trustees meet Tuesday at 7. And the survey. And the survey. So we have that uh, online that's been emailed to you, the ability to do that survey to, to give us information about worship time. And also, you've got uh, paper copies. If you, if you want them, we have paper copies that you can, you can fill out that survey for us. Yes? Wow. Uh, Mary Lou's not here today, but I wanted to mention that she's got a box out here for the um, questionnaires for the directory. If you have your Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, so if you have your information for the directory, there is a box to leave that in for the new directory that we are making. So uh, we will get you, and if you don't have, if you weren't here last week or don't have the form for filling out, we will get you that as well. So it can be in the new directory. Any other announcements for the good of the, the, the community this morning? Well, then let us rise for the call to worship found in your bulletin. Children of God, welcome. Welcome to this place of love and grace. Welcome to this place of hope and perseverance. God invites all of us to be a part of the beloved community. God invites all of us to share in the good news. We are welcome just as we are. We are loved just as we are. In gratitude for all of this, let us worship our God. Let's worship God in the singing of hymn 731, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. Thank you. 
time in our service where we go to the Lord in prayer, and I want to let you know about Frida, that she has uh, been put in, in hospice care, and um, just to, to be pray. I mean, we always pray for, for, for Frida, but just pray for Frida and for Cora, the whole family, as she is, is in this, this time. Um, she, she has been faithful and connected to this church for so long, even though we haven't seen her for years. Her love and affection is, is here, and, and they know, she knows that we hold her in that affection as well. Um, are there other, oh, certainly the prayers for, for Texas and for, for the school where the shooting was, the tragedy that was there, you may hold up Buffalo as well. Um, in that time. We also celebrate that Cindy is able to be on her feet and be with us. We glad, we're glad that you're up, you were up on your feet. So that is good that that surgery went well and she is healing. And uh, Anne? Prayers for our son who's leaders, our representative here in Washington, who now are at crossroads, are at crossroads, and they have an opportunity to make decisions that will uh, hopefully help our country in the future not face some of the same tragedy that we've had in the last school in the last 10 years. It will take our prayers and the help of our Father in heaven to help these people in the children. Amen. And we pray for our leaders. We'll pray for um, the, yeah, the violence. It's so much of the violence we don't hear. We don't hear about these mass shootings, but I mean, there's so many people that die so regularly from, from violence. Um, yeah, we pray that something can be done, that peace can be. We continue to pray for Ukraine as well, and for peace to be in there as well. Are there other prayer concerns or celebrations for us? I have a friend, former colleague, and um, travel companion, uh, Ingrid Hansen, she's a resident of Weaverville, but she, um, I consider her especially young, particularly at heart, but um, she's in her 60s, but has just been given um, anywhere between three weeks to a month uh, to live with her cancer. So we hold up Ingrid in this last month of her, of her, of her life here. <laughs> Or, excuse me, three three weeks to a year. I am sorry. Three, weeks, uh, to three a weeks to a year with treatment. Oh, okay, okay. So we, we hold her up in, the, in, the, in this time. Uh, Sarah has been on our list for some time. She is having a tough time, so we, we hold up Sarah as well. And I saw Chip's hand. Yeah. Uh, my daughter, after God, COVID for all this time on Omaha. So she has She's so strong. She has, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 My brother-in-law has a few days to live. I'm a little worried about my sister uh, because she's nursing for 12 years. Celebrate that and celebrate you being up on your birthday. And we're held up. And what was the name of the woman that Cindy's been praying for? Trudy. 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 Oh, yeah. Trudy. That's a good name. Trudy. And your daughter's name? Anne. Anne. 
and uh, your brother-in-law. John Sharp. Okay. Other um, concerns or celebration requests? School's almost out. Without celebration or you know concern for parents, I'm not sure either way. We'll recognize it. So let us come now to a time of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks for the beauty of the world around us and thanks for living in such a beautiful part of this world. We give you thanks for all the people in our lives that have made your love real for us, whether they uh, be with us and living or they have passed on to your grace. We give you thanks to them. Lord, we hold up for your care, for your healing, and for your strength this day. And, and we hold up this in time of transition um, that grace and, and, and peace be with John and, and his family and Trudy and all those who love her. We hold up Ingrid. Cindy, as she continues to heal, Ruth and Barbara, Sarah, Bob, Enrique, Jeff, Jim, Simon, Philip. We hold up Linda's family. We hold up Chuck and Carol, Luke, Jean. Ruth and Frida. We hold up the leaders of our country that your grace may work in the legislation to bring about more, more peace, more safety, more security. Lord, we hold up to you, Ukraine, all those who are displaced in, um, as refugees, all those who are still there and fighting, we hold up to you that peace may run through your world and that you might bring a, a peaceful resolution that we may not see how. Lord, we hold up all of these things in the name of your Son who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Our first reading this morning is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 6, verses 15 through 23. Chapter, Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 23. What then? Should we sin because we're not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented to your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed. The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Word of God, the joyful Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
where we from over here, and I know that breaks uh, all of our tradition for where we hear the scripture, but um, my NRSV seems to have gone uh, missing. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's some. It's a challenge of having two offices that occasionally shows up. And I wanted to read it to you from the NRSV today because uh, of the word choices used for this particular passage. Um, the translation could be done either way, but I find it, it it's kind of a, a more shocking, a little bit gripping word usage that the NR, that NRSV chooses for this. I'm not sure that it's any more accurate, just different, so it just sounds different. So as we have been working through in this season of Easter, this is the last Sunday of Easter that we celebrate. And um, so next week is Pentecost, the birthday of the church, and we will be in Acts then as well. But we have been following along Acts during this time as we prepare for the birthday, as we look at the work of the young church in the world that Acts gives us the story of. This story comes from Acts 16, verses 16 to 34. Hear now the word. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and thought her and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Cyrus and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs, customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw all the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds, and then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them into the house and set food before them, and he and his entire household rejoiced that they had become a believer in God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was in seminary, I took 
Greek. And when I would do the translations, I felt like it was important to know whether the you that was mentioned was plural or singular. So when I did my translations, I would do the plural you, of course, as y'all, right? That's the only reasonable way to translate it, in my opinion. Now, I went to seminary in Denver, Colorado, and my professor, my teacher for that, was not from the South. And she did not approve of my translation. Now, she, she would not count it wrong. She didn't go far enough to count it wrong, but she did not agree with me in my assessment that it should say y'all. Because she said she had been in the South, and y'all wasn't even plural. Because people would look at her and say, how y'all doing? And she was just there by herself. So obviously, y'all is not plural. And what she didn't understand, because she went from around here, is they were asking about her and her people. You know, mom and them. She, she didn't, didn't, didn't get it. She didn't understand that it was more than just her. Because all of us are connected and engaged in more than just us. People who feel very singular in the world, who have managed to walk through the world with very little connection, even they are connected to some degree to others. We are just an interconnected people. Our families, even if we are estranged to them, are still a part of our understanding and identity. After this, Zoe and I are going to head to a, a Hartzog gathering where, where we, we get together and it's a, it's a part of who we are. And while we can make fun of Hartzogs and our customs and our mannerisms, we, we wouldn't like anybody else to because it is a part of who we are, a part of identity. And all of us have some ways our friends, our connections, our understandings, our belongings that become who we are. Who we are connected to. Who dare say that owns our hearts and our affections. Now, ownership, this idea of slavery, hits us in this passage today. In fact, that's why I wanted the NRSV, because of that drastic word of slaves of the Most High God. It is hard to our ears now. Because we understand slavery to, to be a sin and just wrong in the world. But in the Bible, certainly slavery was a common part of what happened. Slavery still exists today, honestly, just not in the widespread way that it used to, not in the acceptable way within our culture. It seems an anathema that anyone think, would think they could own another person when it said her owners were upset by this. But because a person is of, of God, how could anyone else own them? To be honest, though, we do own other things we consider to be of God. So like property, for example, do you really think you own God's green earth? But we have these deeds that say this portion of it belongs in a, to a certain person. The Native Americans, by the way, didn't understand that. So they had that as being something that could not be owned because well, it, was, it was God's. But I'll say even though that slavery has existed and does exist, there's never been a case of a, of a person owning another one's soul. But yet our soul and our connection are things that we willingly interweave with others. So in this story, we have a woman who is a slave. She is owned by these people, and they use her to make money. Because she has a spirit of divination. So now I'll explain to you what that means. Yeah, I don't know. Just kidding. I'm not going to explain that to you. I don't understand that. I mean, certainly there are people that would say, yeah, um, yeah, that was just the way they understood it in that time, and you're smart enough to know that doesn't really mean that. Personally, I'm going to say I'm smart enough to say I don't know. That is, that is beyond my pay grade. I don't understand what 
that would be. I know that we are called to be people who divine God's will in the world and that we look to God for that. And, and according to the Bible, and I think quite likely true, there are other sources one can go to for such things. And that appears to be the case with this woman. At least that's what we are told. So I'm, I'm going to work with that. Because I told you, beyond my pay grade, she had a spirit. She had something within her that wasn't her that was a part of this. And so she followed around Paul in silence, saying they are slaves to the Most High God. Now the other translations that I had, they said serpents. And I'll tell you, according to the Greek, it's the same. Honestly, it's the same. It's the same word. It's just how it's used and, and how it, it strikes us. But they, she said they are slaves to the most high God. So this spirit of divination was apparently speaking the truth. They could see what was happening. And Paul was annoyed. Maybe not the first time, but eventually, as it continued on, he got annoyed. So I think this is maybe the only place in the Bible where uh, a healing occurs via annoyance. I don't know, maybe there's another situation in it, but this is the only one that I that could come to my mind. Um, so maybe that's not the worst motivation for people to do good in the world. So if you ever see homeless people and you feel annoyed by them, hey, use that energy to do something about homelessness, to help people, to go out and try to do something, help an organization that does that. So maybe an annoyance is, is an okay motivation. And at least for Paul in this story, it is the thing that made him reach out and heal this woman and cast out the spirit. Well, I don't know that she was asking for the spirit to be gone. I've got to assume that one would want oneself to themselves as best as they could. So I'm going to call it a healing, casting this out. Now, those folks who made money off her were not happy with this at all. They were mad. And they brought up the crowd to get them angry about this. These outsiders are coming in. They're shaking stuff up. They ain't not like us. They come around here. They're doing stuff that, that doesn't belong here. So let's, let's get them out. And they got people upset about it. So they severely beat them and cast them into prison. So we have the scene then of Paul and Silas at midnight, middle of the night, not sleeping, singing hymns. Hymns are a powerful resource, both then and now. And if there are times when our hearts are troubled, where we are worried, I think one of the strongest things we can do is to sing a hymn. It's a resource. It's a prayer. Somebody else has written for us that, that we can sing, that can be in our soul. And Silas and Paul were singing. That was their <laughs> comfort in this time. And the prisoners around them were listening, listening to the gospel given to them in these hymns. And then the foundations were shaken. An earthquake came about that opened the doors to the cell, that cast away the shackles on their feet, that set them free from the things that were enslaving them within this prison. And the prison guard came out, saw them open. And I don't know what he would have faced, but apparently he felt it would have been worse than just killing himself quickly. So he was ready to do the job to avoid whatever it is he would have had to face if those prisoners had escaped. And Paul called out in compassion and let him know, you don't have to worry, we're still here. Because surely he would have thought they would have left. Especially in the case of Paul and Silas, because they were rather unfair, unfairly beaten and imprisoned for doing nothing more than healing this woman. And yet they, as well as the other prisoners, went nowhere. They stayed. They stayed where they were. Why? 
Well, for Paul and Silas, we could surely say the Spirit has been moving them through this whole adventure, but the Spirit did not move them out those doors. And they, they knew not to. As far as the other prisoners, that to me is a different question. Why wouldn't they go when freedom was right there? And my thought is, they saw that something more powerful was right where they were. They've been hearing these hymns. We don't know the words to those hymns, but we can assume those hymns were telling them about the gospel. Those hymns were connecting them to God and to something more. And they could tell by this earthquake and how it came about and what it did that the freedom they most needed came from right there where they were. And they would have followed Paul and Silas if they had left. They were staying since they stayed. That's my best guess as to why they stayed. Something bigger was there. Something that was a greater sense of freedom than simply walking free that day. The jailer saw it too. He came in and fell down to them, trembling. And, and maybe he was trembling because, yeah, he was about been ready to kill himself, and he was shaken. But I think it was more than that, that the power that he realized and that he saw and that was a part of what was happening, he recognized it. He wanted to be a part of it. He took them, and we could assume his household was adjacent to this, but he took them in and he washed their wounds to care for them. And then he and his household were baptized, washed by Paul and Silas. In a way that wasn't just to protect infection, but to imbue them with the Spirit. With that freedom that was more than what they could have known otherwise. I wish they told us what happened to the other prisoners too. I would like to think they could have been in on it as well. And maybe they were eventually. They don't tell us that in this story. But this prison guard and his family, they became connected in a new way to what was powerful. Now, the, the epistle reading we heard that Wiley read was Paul talking about this question of slave and free. What does it mean? And he, he talks of it in a way that we can know that um, what does this mean to be a slave to God? And maybe slave isn't the best translation because God does not force God's self on us. There is no forcing us to follow and do what God, God directs us. But there is a way in which we can bind ourselves in servitude to God. And Paul is acknowledging that, that regardless of what you say, you're bound yourself in servitude to something. To other people in your life, to the owners of this woman had bound themselves pretty pretty clearly to making as much money as they possibly could. So you may think it is just for yourself, but really if you're if you're gaining after the prestige and money and acclaim and fame, all those things are how other people think about you, not necessarily just about you. You're a slave to something if you're chasing those things. Now, the truth is, all of us generally want to be liked and we need to make money to survive in the world. And I'm not gonna say that's bad. I accept a, a, a check from the church. So we, we are bound into that. But really the question becomes, what is your primary connection? What is your primary service? Where does the rest of it flow from? Because we all are interconnected in many ways. 
to our family, to our friends, to our work, to our organizations, to what we do. But before we even existed on this earth, we were gods. And when we leave this part of existence and our bodies as they are now, we are gods. In the time in between, we get to choose how are we binding our lives? Are we binding them to how God has called us to be in the world? Are we setting the direction of our life and the choices of our life to God first and foremost? So if we answer that question, <laughs> for most of us, probably is a work in progress. Now maybe, but we, you know, Methodists do believe you can achieve Christian perfection in this lifetime, and if you have, then praise God, amen, most of us are still working on it. Trying to figure out the ways in which we've entangled selfishness or a desire to please others before a desire to please God, and we have to untangle that and work to, to bring ourselves to a place where we can more fully connect in with God and know our power, our understanding, our to know whose we are more fully. The early church, we know because they were made fun of for this, was predominated a great deal by women and by slaves. And women at that time, I'll let you know, honestly, were property too. They were property by the men that was connected to them legally and in the way of understanding. So people who did not know their freedom in a fully autonomous way in society were the ones that were most drawn to finding their freedom but defined by something more than what society could tell them. And as much as we can be grateful for the freedom we have now, and I think we should be on this Memorial Day uh, weekend as we recognize that losses occur for it, we should appreciate that, but we should recognize that our freedom is, is somewhat fleeting because we are bound in so many ways. And the most free place we can be bound is to God because God's grace will ever direct us to that which is the best for us and for the world. That is the place where we know the most meaning, the most connection, the most, most fullness of life. Then we can be like Paul and Silas with no fear of what the rest of the world would do upon us because our identity is so greatly connected to our relationship with God. We can be like the jailer, willing to fall down, to try to move ourselves closer to that sense of being. Because there is a freedom to letting go of worrying about how well we can please all the other people in the world. When we can rest in God's love of us, where we are, and God's need of us in the world. In this last time of Easter, in this season of miracles, let us move forward to be people more closely bound to God that miraculous power, that miraculous connection that holds us in our weakest moment when our foundations are shaken and our strength in all that we are. Let us sign up to be slaves to the Most High God. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is so easy for us to forget 
and to not realize our connection to you. It's so easy for us to serve the needs of selfishness, to serve the desires to, to please others and to get a claim in others' eyes. Is it, it is easy for us to not recognize how the wounds and pains of our lives are entrenching us into the actions which move us farther from you. Lord, increase our faith that we can tremble before you and ask for your connection more fully in our lives. In silence, Lord, we lift to you those things we have done and left undone that have fallen short of your great calling and lift to you those pains and wounds that, that keep us from living the fullness of life, we lift it to you in the trust that your grace, your spirit, will bathe us with new life and forgiveness. the turbulence of our lives, Lord, moor us to you. Connect us. That your strength is in and through us. That your grace and power and new life live in us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Easter season is a season of miraculous power. Let us embrace the power that God has for us this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven and made new. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and made new. Thanks be to God. Now let us rise and rejoice in what has been given as we sing the doxology. They may indeed bring your kingdom on this earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Like Paul and Silas so long ago, we rise to sing hymns. And today we are singing from the faith we sing. So that is the small black hymnal. And it is a hymn. It's 2220. We are God's people. Let us sing with joy.
are called to carry this light within us and let it burn, let it be in our lives, that we might show the gospel in the world, that we might be the light that so much darkness in the world is in need of. Go in that peace. Go in that power. Go in the freedom that Christ gives us to live in service of God. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.